Body piercing. I don't know about you, but boy, do I see a lot of it. It's had a wide history across a lot of ancient modern cultures. And uh, I won't take a survey in this room, but 80 to 90 percent of women have pierced ears. And men are fast joining in on that thing. And the thing that, that slew me the most, one of my favorite actors, the great Indiana Jones, Harrison Ford, shows up in an interview with a pair of steer and it's doing, but that's where we are today, as Kent says. A lot of cultures, however, Indian, African, Native American, many have those low piercings. It's a, it's a passage, it's a sacred ritual. And they hold significance to them, in many cases, spiritual significance, representing sometimes personal beliefs, their ancestry, even social identity. This was an interesting find that was done in Austria in 1991, border between Austria and Italy. They found the mummy was famous, they gave it the name of Utsi. Now, they estimated that it was 3300 BC. Of course, as I said, that's the commonly accepted archaeological dating, which is not consistent with biblical chronology, but it showed as far back as they go, they found this mummy uh, with its ears pierced. So ear piercing has been part of the culture for as long as we can trace it. So I want to talk about getting your ears pierced. Exodus 21.6. If you study the book of Exodus, you find some very interesting practices and laws that happened in Israel. This is from Exodus 21.6. Uh, this is about a slave. This master shall bring him unto God, or Elohim, the judges, shall bring him to the door or unto the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever, for time unlimited. When we look at some of the features of the law at Sinai, uh, we don't always understand why they were given. Sometimes they were to serve a purpose, both not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. Paul talks about this in Galatians 3.24, where he says, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Now, he's talking to the Jews there, okay, because we were never under the law. Gentiles never. But he says in 1 Corinthians 10 11, now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. If all we see in them is history, then we miss the point. Paul says they're there for a purpose. When God gives the first laws of Sinai, he talks about the slaves. He reminds the Israelites that they were slaves in the land. I was the bondsman in the land of Egypt, and Jehovah thy God redeemed it. That was the very first point he wanted them to understand about that law. The Israelites had been slaves in Egypt for several generations. And in Exodus 21, he says, Now these are the laws that are to be set before you. And the small letters you don't need to worry about. Just concentrate on what's in yellow there. First law as he gives them, if you buy a Hebrew servant, he is to serve you for six years, but in the seventh year, he shall go free without paying anything. Verse five, but if the servant declares, I love my master and my wife and children, I do not want to go free. Then this master must take him before the judges, he shall take him to the door or the doorpost and pierce his ear with an awl. Then he will be his servant for life. That was the practice that they had to follow. So even though they were still allowed to have slaves, it was a very different treatment. And this procedure has a very good picture for us in the servitude that we can give to others. The slaves and to Jesus. Now, slaves were to go free after six years of that. One exception was here given. Any slave could pledge this servitude for life in what was a formal ritual. 
They noticed that was not committed uh, to get out of any obligation or anything else because he was to go free without paying anything, but only by the love for his master and the good things that the master had provided to him. I know you're getting where I'm going, aren't you? Yes. I think we have a very beautiful picture here of the granting of freedom that we gained when we come into Christ, entered in this ritual. Yeah. Notice the three elements that are here. There's a piercing, there's a door, and there's an ear involved in these three things. Let's take a look at each of them. Of course, you'd say Jesus' body was pierced on a wooden cross. It was that death that was the means of redemption that set us free. We followed. Remember, his death on the cross was more about uh, the redemption of us to things than it was paying the ransom. This death paid the ransom, and that, as Brother Russell points out, could have been done by any means. But this sacrifice on the cross was redeeming us so that we could follow in his footsteps. That piercing that he had was especially for those that would follow him. The sacrificial death, then, remember Jesus says in John, he says, uh, I am the door. That sacrificial death of so Jesus was a door to which we can enter now into a relationship with God and become sons of God. Without that, we could not. Without that redemption that he paid on the cross. Third, the ear. Punching of the ear. We voluntarily consecrate our lives. We say we don't want to give this up. We want to stay with this master for life. Opening our ears, how does how is our how are our ears punched? Well, the instructions and guidance that we have to hear, hearing the word of God. Where do you get your truth? Where do you understand what we're doing? It's only through listening to the word of God. And yesterday started a new reading of many of the Bible students. I Gretchen is part of that, uh, of reading the volumes again in two years, a little less than two years. I think after that, they'll read the Bible again. Those are the means by which we hear and understand what we are to be. Paul says in Romans 6, 4 to 6, when we were baptized into his death, we were placed into the tomb with him. As Christ was brought back from death to life by the glorious power of the Father, so we too should live a new kind of life. If we're united with him in death, like his, certainly we will be united with him when we come back to life as he did. We know the person we used to be was crucified with him, but it ends sin in our bodies. We are no longer slaves to sin. The pagans had a custom of branding the name and sign of the owner into their skin. What does Paul say? Paul says in Galatians 6.17, From now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Not the physical marks, but he carried with him that redemption that came from Jesus' sacrificial death. When we voluntarily submit to sacrifice our lives, we bear the marks of service. What are those marks? Well, Paul tells us in Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. How many people do you know outside the brotherhood that are striving to put these things on? Those are our marks the marks that we bear from the body of Jesus. Second, the door. That your Lord was put against the door or the doorpost and punched. Jesus said in John 10, truly, truly, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and go out and shall find pasture. How do you go in and out? Jesus. We have his words and we are able to understand them. And we can rely on him when we're in times of trouble. And we 
to develop ourselves along the same lines as he gave us. That's the pasture he gives us. The feeding he gives us is through the word of God. In Revelation 22, we have that picture. He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare the twelve manna of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Blessed are they that do these his commandments, that they you may have the right to the tree of life, you may enter in through the gates into the city. We have that beautiful picture in Ezekiel of those coming into the temple and entering through the gates uh, to be redeemed and to understand the way. Rather, we enter into those gates of the city today. We are what Paul calls the new Jerusalem. And we enter into those gates through the door that Jesus provides in redemption. He gives us that opportunity to move from one environment, the world, to another, to heaven. Finally, the ears, third thing. When we look at Leviticus 8 and the consecration of the priesthood, it says he brought Aaron's sons, and Moses put of the blood upon the tip of their right ear and upon the thumb of the right hand, and upon the great toe of the right foot, and sprinkled blood about the altar all around. That consecration of the priesthood was an important part of the ritual for those under priests to be able to serve. In Psalm 40, verse 6, David utters, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. All God wants from us is to hear that word, to have that blood sprinkled on our ears so we hear the word of God and can respond to it. No matter how much we would give, if we don't do it according to the word of God, it's not going to be accepted. That bullet could not take away sin as we know. Only the perfect man could redeem the sinner. And that's why we needed Jesus to do his work and to die on that cross. There were seven days of consecration of that priesthood. And the second ram that was that was uh, sacrificed was called the ram of consecration. That ram showed how God received that sacrifice and received them into the priesthood. That's really where we are then. That ram of consecration. God accepts us based on the perfection of that boy that redeemed us. When you read the account in 830, you say that these under priests, they could not assist the high priest until they were sprinkled with that blood mixed with the holy anointing oil. And when did they do that? It was on the eighth day of the first month. That was the first time they could now assist the high priest uh, at the altar of Jehovah. Brother Fry comments on that in his book on the tabernacle. No, it's on the tabernacle. But think about that. It's the eighth day, brethren, when we celebrate that we're able to assist the high priest in the altar of Jehovah. The work on earth is complete after the 7,000 years are done. On that eighth day is when the ages of ages began a work that we have not yet to know. We are cleansed now from sin, but that cleansing must continue throughout the millennial age. You read here in Leviticus 14 about the ritual for cleansing from leprosy. Remember that leprosy represents sin. The priest shall dip his right finger in the oil is in his left hand, sprinkle the oil with his finger seven times. The rest of the oil is in his hand. He shall put upon the tip of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed. That ritual, cleansing from liberty, leprosy, atoned for by the blood applied to the same places as in the consecration of the priesthood, the ear, the thumb, and the toe. 
When the world is cleansed, mankind is to be freed from Adamic sin and the resurrection. It takes a long time. That sprinkling takes place on them. They must open their ears. They must be open and hear what God has provided for them. And mankind won't be actually free from that Adamic death until the end of the seventh day. It will take that whole process and a test similar to what Adam had to bring a person from the depths of sin to a life in the kingdom that brings them out of the 6,000 years of slavery and the sin. What a beautiful picture God has given me. It's only after that millennial age test on the eighth day that man will truly be free, truly be free to choose for what? The same thing we choose now, to have their ear pierced and to follow the master and to follow the ways of God. Remember Jesus said in John 5, 22, the father judges no one but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. Jesus completes that final judgment when then man is turned to God. Jesus is called the father of futurity in Rotherham's translation tonight of Isaiah because he is truly the father of the millennial age. And I think it was Brother Murray, Everett Murray, some of you may remember Brother Murray is saying, what will God be then? Well, God will be the grandfather. What does a grandfather like to do? Spoil his kids. And that's what will happen to him. Let us rejoice and be glad with them. While in this life now, we wear a robe on ourselves. It's a robe of righteousness that comes from the cross of Christ. We're set apart by sufferings for Christ who bear his marks. We enter a door to sonship. We have a relationship with Jehovah through the Holy Spirit as a new creature in Christ. Spiritual blessings that we get are attained through hearing and paying attention to the word of God and understanding it, and paying attention to those exceeding great and precious promises. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, for our light affliction, which is for the moment, worketh for us more and more exceedingly the eternal weight of glory. Brethren, consecration is just the beginning. It's just the beginning, that piercing of the ear, is just the beginning of an eternity with Jesus. I like volume one, the concluding thoughts chapter. It just came up in a precious promise on Thursday night that we have. If you give diligence to the word of God and receive its truths into a good, honest, consecrated heart, it will be getting you such a love for God and his plan such a desire to tell the good tidings, to preach the gospel, that it will become the all-absorbing thing of life thereafter. Brethren, I challenge every one of you are here because this gospel has become the all-absorbing theme of our life. We will give up everything in order to have it. And the Lord bless each of us as we make those efforts.